Welcome to the People's Health Briefing, a component of the Trusted Voices Campaign. I'm Dr. Noha Avalada from Roots Community Health Center reporting for the week of January 9th, 2023. Our first briefing of 2023, a new season of the People's Health Briefing. And I'll be reviewing a new variant for the new season, XBB15. As health professionals rooted in Oakland serving some of the people most vulnerable to getting and suffering from COVID-19, we're here to cut through the noise to give you information you can use to make choices that will keep you, your loved ones, and your community as safe as possible. The goal of the People's Health Briefing is to empower you with our best knowledge and thinking every Tuesday morning. Briefly regarding flu and RSV, activity for both remains high, but does look to be declining in most areas. RSV cases are continuing to drop, though they're still high for this time of year. Hopefully this will be the tail end of the RSV season. Um, but so far this season regarding flu, there have been at least 22 million flu illnesses, 230,000 flu hospitalizations, and 14,000 deaths from the flu so far this season. 74 of those were among children. And flu cases do appear to be coming down, but some years we do have kind of another second peak. So we'll just keep an eye on flu cases. The good news about flu is that our vaccine is well matched to the variants that are circulating and is also susceptible to all of our antiviral treatments. So everyone six months and up should get a flu vaccine. And if you're someone at risk of a poor outcome from flu, you should have a treatment plan to be treated with an antiviral, ideally within the first 48 hours of flu symptoms. And moving on to COVID-19. Alameda County total cases over the previous 14 days does appear to be dipping down. We do know that this is an undercount given that the volume of testing has gone down significantly. So here in Alameda County, this is based upon only about 2000 tests per day. But as you can see, the percent positivity is quite high at 11% positivity. But again, this is a small subset of the total number of cases given a fact that a lot of people are not testing at all or are home testing. So when we look at hospitalizations, unfortunately, these are rather high. We're already at the level of our peak in the summertime surge and anticipate that this will continue to go up as all of the modeling would suggest. So we currently have 168 people in the hospital with COVID-19, 13 of those in the ICU. I think the good news here is that the ICU hospitalizations are not going up at the same rate as the hospitalizations as we used to see in prior waves, but certainly we don't like to see hospitalizations being this high. And this increase in hospitalizations is something that we're seeing across the entire United States. As you can see here on this graph, on the left, we're looking at all ages. On the right, it's broken down by age group. And as you can see, the greatest increase is in those 70 and older. And essentially hospitalizations are increasing in all regions across all age groups in the United States. But I will say that when we look at certain regions like in the Northeast, we're seeing an even sharper increase in hospitalizations. And I'll talk more about that in just a bit. Unfortunately, we're looking at daily deaths. We are at 504 deaths per day. This is over 3,500 deaths per week. Now, when I reported on this last, which was two weeks ago, we were at 375 deaths per day. So definitely going in the wrong direction here. This is a terrible place to be, over 500 deaths per day. And as I've shared previously, the modeling by the CDC does predict that this will continue to increase throughout this month and into February. The sources that I usually refer to for wastewater have not been updated yet this year. So I do still remain hopeful that since case counts aren't very reliable anymore, that we will be able to rely on wastewater to help tell us where we are. So hopefully that information will be updated more consistently in the future, but not today. Looking at variant proportions, we have the XBB15, which is in the lavender color there. And that has just pretty much burst on the scene. When I reported two weeks ago, this wasn't even noted on the tracker at all, but now the XBB has, XBB15 has been separated out from the XBB. So you can see both the XBB and XBB15. 
And seemingly overnight, that XBB15 has risen to almost 28% of sequence specimens in the United States. This is a concerning development in and of itself that we're going to talk about in a little bit more detail in a bit. Uh, we still have quite a bit of the BQs, and I've been talking about the BQs and the XBBs in the past few weeks just because they are immune evasive, which was already concerning, and the XBB appears to be just as immune evasive with some new special properties that I'm going to discuss shortly. Looking at the variants by region, we see that XBB15 has really taken over in the Northeast area and it's comprising almost 75% of cases there. And when we look at hospitalizations in the Northeast, so regions one and two, those regions with the highest proportions of XBB15, we do see fairly significant increases in hospitalizations. So is this because of XBB15? I think this is really difficult for us to prove because we need a lot more information to understand that level of detail. But it certainly is suspicious that XBB15 is driving current infections in those regions and that we are at the same time seeing significant increases in hospitalizations that look to be more steep than in other regions or the country as a whole. So before I get into more detail about what we know about XBB15, I will just say that this is not the only variant we're keeping an eye on. Uh, we also have ZH11, which I talked about a couple of weeks ago. We know we've seen here in California, it does have some concerning, uh, concerning mutation. But at this time, I'm really focusing on XBB15 because it is on the move, it's increasing quickly, and we need to understand why that is and what that might mean. So XBB15 is a descendant of XBB, which again, I've been talking about for the last couple of weeks, primarily because we know that XBB does a great job of evading our prior immunity. So XBB came about from two earlier versions of Omicron, basically swapping genes. So it was the BA2101 and the BA2.75. And so the lineage was first detected in the United States. So it was born and raised right here in the US with a first collection was noted in late October of 2022. And the CDC is reporting a doubling time of the proportion of XBB15 of nine days. So it's doubling in the amount every nine days. So it's kind of poised to take over across the United States. And the XBB15 has a specific mutation in the spike protein. And this is a mutation that has come up before. It's been rare uh, because it requires two substitutions out of a set of three that kind of make up the different amino acids in the chain. And so it's been rare and it's even previously been unsuccessful. So it's popped up and then gone away. Uh, but this time it has stuck. And so now I'm going to review this preprint article that came out on January 5th, it hasn't been peer reviewed yet, but it comes from the lab of Yunlong Kao, who's an immunologist. I've been following closely because he's been doing extensive work on SARS-CoV-2 sequencing and putting out a lot of great research on the emerging variants throughout the pandemic. And this article is entitled Enhanced Transmissibility of XBB15 is Contributed by both strong ACE2 binding and antibody evasion. So what does this mean? So let's break it down. Let's start with enhanced transmissibility. This is one of the graphs in the article and it's simply showing that each strain over time, uh, the, the change in the amount of each strain over time, and you can see this concerning growth curve of XBB15 while the BQ is coming down and all the other XBBs are kind of flat, and this is taking us through mid-December. And we know that since then, XBB continues to grow at an exponential rate. And in fact, it has been identified in about 30 different countries already. Now let's talk about the antibody evasion part of this. And this is something I've talked about previously because XBB and the BQs have the same problem. And that is that they managed to get around the antibodies we've made either from prior infection or from vaccine. 
So this is something that they test in the lab by looking at plasma from previously infected people or previously vaccinated people. And they also tested the effectiveness of our monoclonal antibody treatments that we were using and found that those antibody treatments were completely ineffective against XBB15. So basically prior immunity or antibodies that were tuned against the prior Omicrons, completely ineffective against the XBB15. Now, mind you, this is the same antibody evasion that we were seeing with XBB. So what is going on with this XBB15? So that brings us to the strong ACE2 binding capability. So what does this mean? So you'll recall that the SARS-CoV-2 gets into our cells by latching onto a receptor called ACE2 that's on the outside of our cells. And I borrowed this graphic from an article in The Conversation, which is a great resource I linked in the post. And so the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein latches onto the ACE2 receptors which are on our cells in many parts of our body, including our airways. And that binding is what helps SARS-CoV-2 get into our cells where it then replicates and starts causing us problems. So what this article describes is that the XBB15 does a much better job of latching onto that ACE2 receptor than its predecessors did. And so this is what we call a higher ACE2 binding affinity. And it's even higher than what we saw with the regular XBB or with the BQ11. And at least in the lab, this seems to be what is differentiating XBB15 from the others. So we know that there's that mutation on the spike protein and that is what is seeming to give it this advantage where it is latching on much better to our ACE2 receptors of our cells. They also noted that the strong binding of the XBB15 to our ACE2 receptors might allow XBB15 to rack up even more mutations that evade our immune system. So this is definitely something that we're going to need to closely monitor. And this was probably one of the more alarming things that I think came out of this study. So basically they concluded that because XBB15 has very similar antibody evasion to XBB, that the amount of antibody evasion must not be the reason why XBB15 is taking off the way it is around the world. And that seems like a reasonable conclusion. They also concluded that because XBB15 binds so well to the ACE2 receptors, so much better than XBB, that this must be the reason for its growth advantage, or this must be the reason why it's taking off across the world and around the country. And I don't think this is necessarily an unreasonable conclusion, but I don't think we have quite enough evidence to say that this is the main reason or the only reason for XBB15's growth advantage. So I do think we're gonna need additional study to see how it behaves in different regions. Uh, we'll need more study to tell us if it's making people sicker. That is, is it making, is it inherently more dangerous or is it just more contagious? And so we have more cases and then that's why we might have more hospitalizations. So these lab studies are really helpful in helping us understand how the virus is behaving in the lab uh, against our antibodies, our treatments and so on. But we still do have a lot more to learn about how it's going to behave in the real world, how it's going to compete with other variants and how it's going to respond to our different interventions, including treatments. As far as the impact of vaccination, what it looks like is that the booster is improving our ability to fight infection, even against the XBB15. And this is especially true in our older age groups where we're seeing a significant reduction in hospitalization or death with boosted uh, elders in particular. How great is the protection against XBB15? I think it's still too early to say, but based on this study, it doesn't look worse than XBB or BQ. And at this point in time, I think the bottom line is that getting vaccinated now, if you are due for a booster is an important layer of protection to get you through the winter surge. And so immunologist Yan Long Kao was quoted in Nature Magazine January 9th by saying about the XBB, it is most certainly going to dominate in the world. I cannot find a singular competitor now. Everything else is incomparable. So that, uh, you know, so yes, we have a new variant. It is causing trouble. 
Uh, it is the most competitive, appears to be the most competitive right now. I think that leaves an opening to say a couple things. First of all, yes, we have a new variant. It is causing trouble. But the way to deal with it is the same way to deal with all the variants, which is that we have to um, mask and vaccinate and ventilate our spaces. I think the biggest takeaway that we have to acknowledge is that we are still a bit at the mercy of this evolving virus that we continue to allow to spread uh, in an unmitigated fashion. And that is why we keep ending up with more and more difficult variants. Mutations happen, viruses mutate. That is just what they do. And the way we get it to stop mutating at such a rapid rate is by stopping such a frequent transmission. And we do that mainly through better ventilation in our indoor spaces, wearing a mask so that we can stop passing this thing around. And yes, we are very much in need of better vaccines that can actually stop transmission. Right now, our vaccines do seem to be holding up in terms of preventing the most severe outcomes, but we keep having to get boosted in order to kind of refresh our response. And so I think it's clear that we're going to need a better strategy going forward. But until then, until then, I want to emphasize that we need to be either getting the Omicron booster. If you're not vaccinated, please consider the Novavax but we need to be staying up to date until then. But it does seem clear that we are going to need a better strategy in terms of our vaccines that can stop getting some transmission uh, blocking type of vaccines. And I also believe strongly that we are going to need some replacements for the monoclonals that have been made obsolete by all these new variants. Uh, we're going to need upgraded antibodies for those who need them. And again, until then, it's all about ventilation and filtration. And remember, filtration includes a filter on your face. N95s, KN95s, KF94s. In our last briefing, I complimented the city of Oakland for resuming masks and indoor spaces, including libraries and senior centers, huge important move. And now I'm gonna give a little shout out to Stanford University who put out a statement that strongly recommends classroom masking for January. And what I liked about their statement is that they also allow professors to require masks within their classrooms and to easily order their masking supplies. They didn't specify if they're filtration masks, but I certainly hope that they are uh, They are filtration masks like KN95s or N95s. And I think this is absolutely the right thing to do. If you're not going to require masks for the entire school, at least give the teachers and the professors the discretion to require them within their classrooms. This is something I would love to see other schools strongly consider or adopt. So best practices to stop the spread of respiratory viruses. I know we all know this. We're going to mask, we're going to ventilate our indoor spaces, filtration, we're gonna get vaccinated and boosted. But let's not forget the hand washing and sanitizing. I know that seems like it tried to go by the wayside, uh, but a lot of things do spread through contact. So let's not stop washing our hands and cleaning our surfaces, especially high touch surfaces. We're going to gather outdoors as much as possible, but we also know that's not 100% foolproof. We've actually been hearing of some cases of folks catching it recently, uh, apparently uh, outdoors. So remember that just because you're outdoors doesn't mean you can't catch it. So try to maintain a safe distance or go ahead and pop on the mask if it's a crowded outdoor space. Uh, and also implement pre-gathering testing for an added layer of protection. We are still losing over 500 people per day to prevent those most severe and tragic outcomes of SARS-CoV-2 and to reduce or prevent the risk of long COVID, uh, vaccination and boosters are still remarkably effective. They're effective at allowing you to survive. Even if you do catch COVID, it allows you to be less likely to catch COVID, which means you're less likely to also get long COVID. And treatment then also cuts your risk by another 80% or so of hospitalization or death. So let's please not forget our treatments. The good news so far is that these treatments are holding up against all of the variants. So number one, Paxlovid, number two, Remdesivir, these are reducing the risk of hospitalization and death by over 80%. So please do not forget about these and don't wait till you get sick, make a treatment plan with your doctor so that you know how to get treated in the event that you are someone who should be treated. If you don't have a primary care provider, please get one. Make sure you know how to reach them before you need treatment. Maintain a balanced diet, exercise, stay safe in these storms though, and might wanna take some extra vitamin D since we're not getting much uh, sunshine. Manage your stress, consider that multivitamin supplement with the vitamin D and get a good night's sleep. 
Thank you so much for joining us. Please send your questions or any feedback you might have to admin at rootsclinic.org. And we look forward to seeing you again next Tuesday at 10 a.m. See you then.